And we begin tonight with one of the oldest established rights in American law, the right to a speedy trial. It is the first right listed in the Sixth Amendment, but its origins go back to the Magna Carta, one of the most important legal documents in the history of democracy, written by a group of 13th century barons to protect their rights and property against a tyrannical king. The Magna Carta declared in English, spelled a little bit differently than it is today, we shall not deny or delay justice and right, neither the end, which is justice, nor the mean whereby we may attain to the end, and that is the law, thereby protecting the right of all freemen to speedy disposition of trials. The right is a cornerstone of the judicial system, meaning a person cannot be held for an unreasonable amount of time awaiting trial. It's a fundamental constitutional right that impacts a modern day criminal case that could help preserve the very principles the Magna Carta established more than 800 years ago. And that is the Georgia election interference case. Today, Fulton County Judge Scott McAfee ruled that Donald Trump and 16 other co-defendants will be tried separately from Trump's former attorneys, Sidney Powell and Kenneth Cheeseborough. Cheeseboro and Powell requested speedy, speedy trials, while their other co-defendants did not. They are set to be tried starting October 23rd. The ruling handed a defeat to Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis, who argued for trying all 19 defendants together and who said that she was ready to begin next month. It also means Trump likely will not face trial until next year. Trump has waived his right to a speedy trial, choosing instead to benefit from delaying his day in court. As D.A. Willis has noted, multiple drawn-out trials will create an enormous strain on the courts and her office and give defendants who wait an advantage. And let's just be clear, Trump doesn't want to speed this up or simply create strategic delays. He never wants to go to trial at all. He wants to become president again and fully execute his autocratic dreams by maybe firing the federal prosecutors and pardoning himself or otherwise extinguishing the legal cases against him, even the state ones that he can't pardon his way out of, using the intimidation and power of the presidency. Donald Trump is not a normal politician. He is a wannabe autocrat who is attacking American democracy at its core. He is not, however, the only threat we face because his party the MAGA faction, as well as the normies, even the ones running against him for president, are now wholly consumed by his authoritarian outlook or too cowardly to do anything other than give in, while those who are not on board are forced out and expelled. One of Trump's obsessions, besides overturning the will of American voters, is ousting any official who dares to defend their oaths to the Constitution. Trump sought revenge for Republican Liz Cheney's vote to impeach him and her work on the House committee investigating him, leading to her losing her primary in Wyoming to a Trump-backed challenger. He sought revenge against those who dared to run a fair election, like Republican Rusty Bowers, the Arizona House Speaker who stood up to Trump's demand that he overturn Arizona's election result. Well, he paid the price, too losing a bid for state Senate for a state Senate seat to a Trump backed opponent. And today in Wisconsin, the Republican controlled Senate voted to fire the state's elections chief just months before the battleground state's presidential primary. This is Republican extremism in the age of Trump, as House Speaker Kevin McCarthy had to once again take the knee to MAGA lawmakers threatening to cast him out of the speakership in a meeting that devolved into a tirade of F-bombs and taunts. And we'll have more on that mess later in the show. The disarray among House Republicans is just one reason Utah Senator Mitt Romney will not seek re-election, a sign of just how far his party has fallen. Mitt Romney, the 2012 Republican presidential standard bearer, the senator who's, who voted twice to convict Trump on impeachment charges, is now part of the exodus but not before spilling some serious tea and torching his party for pursuing power over the people. A very large portion of my party really doesn't believe in the Constitution, Romney told writer McKay Coppins as part of his forthcoming biography. Along with, the, along with the chilling warning that authoritarianism is like a gargoyle lurking over the cathedral, ready to pounce. 
Joining me now is Steve Schmidt, former Republican strategist and the founder of the Warning Newsletter podcast and YouTube channel, to which I subscribe and recommend that you do, too. Steve, it is good to see you. It has been too long, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on. Good to see you, Joy. You bet. Let's good talk. to see you. So, you know, I feel like you're the perfect person to talk about this watching the people, the Mitt Romneys of the world sort of walk away, right? I mean, this McKay Coppins article is fascinating. And, and Romney talks about what kind of shocked him when he got to the Senate, that so many people there, all they care about is remaining in office and only secondarily about ideas and policy. Is that the Republican Party that you were familiar with when you were working actively in it? No, of course not. Um, but it is the Republican Party today. Every single person I worked with in Republican politics, with, with very, very few exceptions, all of them, have taken a pass on the U.S. Constitution. They've become faithless for it. Those that remain in politics are part of the MAGA project. They're part of the Trump project. And what the moment required were people to say no. Never, never, ever. I'm one of those people. Mitt Romney was one of those people. It's a very small group of people. And at the end of the day, the most important thing about this moment to understand is the American way of life. Forget politics. The American way of life, our civilization, is entirely dependent on an elections process. It is built around the election process. When, when you look at the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King was not someone from the French Revolution. He wasn't trying to burn down the society to take from the oppressor. His proposition was very simple. The American way of life is dependent on this right the right to vote. This is how we apportion political power temporarily with tremendous constraints, with forever protections around the rights of the individual. There's no place to meet in the middle. There's no compromise route if this collapses. And it has been a national emergency since 2015, the first time Donald Trump said he would not honor the results of a federal election. And as a result, seven years on, we have a whole society crisis because the way of life that is sustained by elections is the American system. It's the American way of life. So, so it's not possible to overstate the severity of this moment. You know, and, it, you know, January 6th was such a, a chilling moment, I think, for everyone, hopefully everyone, well, not everyone, actually, some people are kind of trying to justify it. But it really did um, sort of veer us into the kind of society in which elections are maybe decided in the streets, uh, which some people in this country seem to want it to be. I have to read you this text. This is a text from Mitt Romney to Mitch McConnell. And he actually sent this on January 2nd um, about his concerns that Angus King, his fellow senator, had cast him, please call me. So he calls him, and then he sends this text, Romney does to Mitch McConnell. Um, Romney sends in the text, in case you have not heard this, I just got a call from Angus King, who said that he had spoken with a senior official at the Pentagon, who reports that they are seeing very disturbing social media traffic regarding the protests planned on the 6th. There are calls to burn down your home, Mitch, to smuggle guns into D.C. and to storm the Capitol. I hope that sufficient security plans are in place, but I am concerned that the instigator, the president, is the one who commands the reinforcements the D.C. and Capitol Police might require. McConnell never responds. We have some video of what happened with Mitt Romney on that day uh, when he was saved by Capitol Police as they helped him run out of there. I think we have that video. Um, what do you make of the fact that the leader of the Senate at the time, Mitt, uh, Mitch McConnell, who appears a lot in this article, seemed completely in, unwilling to respond to the threat of Trump, even when it meant the threat to his own members? Historically, he will be remembered as a repugnant figure. Uh, the abdication of his duty, um, the responsibility and the obligations are epic. So he received that email, which is chilling from Mitt Romney, 
And what did he do? He did what he has done for seven years. He did nothing. Like a turtle, he tried to put his head in the sand. He is the living embodiment of John Kennedy's admonition from his inaugural about those who seek power by trying to ride the back of the tiger only to wind up inside. What Mitch McConnell's legacy is substantially is he is the man who broke the United States Senate, which was once considered the greatest deliberative body in the world. He is an appeaser par excellence. So you have a storm system of cynicism, of cowardice, of racial malice that all combines to form under Donald Trump and has now threatened the cornerstone of the whole society, which is who gets to decide who's in power in the country? Is it something that's bestowed by the American people or is it someone who's taken or is it something that's taken by the richest, the strongest and the most powerful? This is an existential question.